No. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. We're gl- you're all awake this morning. Fantastic. Everyone's had the, uh, the extra coffee or the extra caffeine or whatever it is that, uh, that you uh, drink to get going in the morning. Um, I want to share a few announcements with you this morning. Uh, most of them have been on the screen as you've been sitting there, but they are in your bulletin, so hopefully you grabbed a bulletin. Uh, this coming Saturday night, this coming Saturday night at 7 o'clock, uh, we've done a few of these. We haven't been, um, we started them be- before COVID, and I think we had a couple in the midst of COVID, but we're really, you're going to hear, be hearing more about these as we go on. So regional worship night. So uh, these are initiatives that we've undertaken here in Southwest Nova Scotia to gather the church together, to worship together. Some of you that have been around for a while, you remember quarterly meetings and how meaningful they were. So we heard you. Uh, We know that there's value in us gathering as a church together. And so we do these at Yarmouth Wesleyan for the simple purpose of it's the only facility uh, big enough to host or to hold um, that many people. Uh, But it's not a Yarmouth Wesleyan church event. We all participate from different churches and uh, from Barrington all the way up uh, to Digby. And so that's Saturday night. And if you feel like I'm putting a little bit of pressure on for you to be there, um, you will not regret going. Seven o'clock, it'll be a time for you to sit in the presence of Jesus. It's uh, a lot of worship music, a little bit of teaching. And I haven't spoke to one person. I'll I'll make this promise, and I I don't make this by accident, or I don't make it uh, by joke. If you make the trip down there and it's not worth your time, tell me and I will pay for your gas. I, I mean that. I, I, I'm that convinced. Now, you've got to be serious about it because I'm going to ask you, what didn't you like about it and what do we need to change? Uh, but if it doesn't fill your cup up a little bit, I make that promise. I will pay for your gas, um, that whatever it costs. And please drive something fuel economical. <laughs> But those worship nights are an incredible gathering uh, for our region uh, to get together. And so that's 7 o'clock Saturday Saturday night at Yarmouth Wesleyan Church. Next Saturday, uh, February 4th, we're having a movie night here at the church. And so uh, somebody asked, I can't make it for four. Can I come for the pizza night and then the movie after? Yes, absolutely. If you're working that day and can't get here till four. So four o'clock, we're showing the Billy Graham uh, story. Um, and it's here, upstairs, right here, and then down below, we're going to have a pizza potluck following, so if you're coming for supper, bring a pizza with you, bring a couple of pizzas with you, it's a pizza potluck, and so bring pizza, we're going to have pizza downstairs in between the movies, and then at 6.30, we're going to show the movie, I Still Believe, and it's Jeremy Camp's, um, it's a story that, of, uh, the song behind, the reason behind the song that he wrote, if you know, if you're familiar with the, the song. And so it's an incredible movie. And so invite somebody to come with you. Uh, it's going to be a great time just to gather uh, in here uh, for some fun with pizza, uh, but to watch a couple of great movies on February 4th. And then it's a little ways away, but uh, the Heritage Day holiday aka family day holiday we're having a bonfire right out here if you haven't got rid of your christmas tree yet your real christmas tree i don't want your artificial christmas tree but your real christmas tree you can put it in the pile that's out there i think there's a couple out there already the big one that's out front of the church is going to get moved down there Uh, you can drop it off there anytime and we're going to have a bonfire and so that's all that is happening. Uh, digging deeper groups start back up today. We're going to have uh, facilitator guides. We're going to break off into groups, get back into that rhythm and routine. And we're excited to be able to be doing that. So if the worship team wants to come on up as we prepare to worship, we're going to have prayer this morning and pray for some needs. Uh, the needs are in your bulletin. And I uh, encourage you to be not only praying for those needs, but if there are people, families that you know, uh, a phone call, reach out, a visit, all of those things are so incredibly meaningful uh, to folks. And so not only be praying, uh, but be doing as well, and because that's what we're called to as a church. So God bless you this morning. Let's pray just before the worship team leads us in, in singing this morning. Father God, this morning, thank you so much. Thank you for who you are and what you mean to us. And Father, I can think of different different stories that that i know of of just this week father of 
of situations and people that are walking through some dark, dark times. And how in the midst of their brokenness, in the midst of their hurt, and in the midst of their pain, they're still celebrating that God is on the throne. God is real. And you still want to do what you've always done. And so God, I pray that as we gather in here this morning as your church, what a privilege and joy that that is, that so often we take it for granted. That God, that we would worship you this morning as your word calls us to do, that we would worship you in spirit and in truth. And so, God, we pray for those that are in our bulletin, those that are walking through some difficult roads right now. I pray that that you would have your healing hand upon them. I pray that you would speak to them and through them. I pray for our loved ones, some of them that might be far from Jesus. But God, that you would continue to minister to them. And so God, I pray that as we worship you this morning, as we sing these songs, as we open up your word, God, that you would encourage our hearts today. And we ask all of these things in your name. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Good to see you all. And um, good to have those that are online, too. Um, We've had a couple of birthdays this week, not mentioning names, well, you'll know who I'm talking about anyway, they, they are faithful to be here every week, one of them, and um, Lori said, well, we can't ask him to play for his own birthday, but <laughs> if he wants to, that's fine, the rest of us are going to sing happy birthday. And we got one at the back that said a birthday yesterday. Yes, I know, there's a couple, but I'm talking about one up here. <laughs> Happy birthday to you, happy birthday to you, God bless you and keep you, happy birthday to you. All right. I was singing for the other one. (laughs) (laughs) All right, we're going to... why don't you stand as we sing these next these couple of songs? Um, I know um, sometimes um, is uh, easier than others. It's been hard the last few years and a couple of years anyway. And um, I need a revival in my soul. And I know that I'm not I'm speaking for me, but I know I speak for a lot of you too. And we're going to sing about that this morning. And we're going to start out thanking the Lord for what he's done for us and uh, just stand as we sing these two songs and thank you <clears throat> yeah thank you Lord for saving my soul thank you Lord for making me whole thank you Lord for to me, thy great salvation. 
I was reminded this week, um, I was looking around for something new to watch, and I put Beth Moore on. I haven't watched her for a long time. And I was just reminded that um, God says where two or three are gathered, he's there also. And so the Holy Spirit is here this morning, and we just um, want to give him free reign to speak to our hearts. And um, we're just going to sing some more worshiping him. Jesus, all for Jesus, all I am and have and ever hope to be. favorite old songs that uh, is a favorite for most of us it is well I hope you can say that this morning whatever's going on in your life that it is well with my soul when
we're just going to end off before Pastor comes with Because He Lives. A lot of times we just do the chorus, but we're going to do the whole song this morning. Because He lives, I can face tomorrow. Kids are dismissed to go down to the lower level for Kids Church. What a powerful song. I was thinking about, well, that's, I have no idea when that song is written. I've been here, I've heard it sung for as long as I've been alive. So that gives you any indication. It's, it's old. It's an old song is what I'm trying to say. But you know, the songs, songs take on different meanings depending on, uh, on what, uh, what time of life you're in and what you've experienced and all that. And I was thinking about that song um, as we were singing it this morning. And uh, boy, oh boy, 
I can face tomorrow because he lives. You know, and our world and our culture tells us that uh, life's not worth going on and we feel those types of ways and the enemy tries to put those thoughts in our, in our minds. We can look the old devil square in the face and say, no, my Jesus lives. I don't know what tomorrow holds. I don't even know what, this, I don't know what later on this morning holds. It's only 11 o'clock. A lot can happen in an hour. But my God is faithful. Because he lives, what powerful words. We can face it, not on our own strength, but on his strength in us. I want to share this morning from, what, where are we going to be this morning in our scripture reading? We all should know by now. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. I'm not going to ask how many of you did your homework. If you weren't here last week and you didn't watch online, then you have no responsibility to do your homework. But if you're here this morning, then you've got homework now. And what I asked last week is that for the next 13 weeks as we spend our time in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, is that you, so for you overachievers, would you read that chapter every day? For you that uh, just, okay, what do I, what's the bare minimum that I need to do to get by? Would you read it once this week? Will you listen to it? The, the, uh, the Bible app, I don't have my phone right here with me, the Bible app has, has this little, little neat play button that uh, if you just want to play the scripture, it'll read it to you. It's fantastic. I remember back in the day, remember those uh, round circle things? They were kind of silver and your car could play them, you could put them in. They were called, C- you know why they were called CDs, right? Cassette tapes had side A and side B, so when CDs came out, it was CD, right? That's, sorry, bad joke. But I remember bad, back in the day, some of you are still waking up with it. My, uh, my brother was driving transport, and we bought him, or somebody bought him, uh, the whole Bible on CD. And so he took in more of the Bible, driving up and down the road. He'd plug in CD after CD after CD. Uh, so I don't care how you get God's Word in, you just do it. Um, so would you read it? 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Read it in a different translation than what you're used to. Sometimes we're going to do that this morning in just a moment. But we're going to spend these next 13 weeks in uh, this passage of Scripture. And what I want us to understand, I hope I unpacked okay last week, is that this isn't some um, romantic idea of what love is, but this is how God calls us to live. And we are most like Him when we live this way. Because God is love. So it's not kind of a mushy, feel-good type of romantic love. It's an agape love of how God has called us to love Him and to love others. And there's some responsibilities that we have as followers of Jesus. Now, if you're not a follower of Jesus, you're not completely off the hook. Because God calls us all to be in relationship with Him. But this is something that is foundational, we believe, in full disclosure... And uh, I hope you know this by now. Uh, but, and so, uh, Catherine actually pointed this out to me this week. When we're working on these message series and all that, please understand these aren't all my thoughts. We work on these in conjunction. And so uh, many times it's a, it's a combination of, of lots of conversations and converse, uh, texts and all of those types of things. But you understand, and it was her that said that, in large churches, no pastor is preparing his own messages. Please know that, right? Like, if you're listening to somebody of any size, they've got a staff, they've got people that resource for them and do all the research, which is no disrespect to them. It's, it allows them to communicate in the way that they do. Uh, but this is truly a tag team effort for these next um, 13 weeks, even though I might be the, the voice uh, up here giving it. On her arrival in India, she began by working as a teacher. However, the widespread poverty of Calcutta made a very deep impression on her. And this led to her starting a new order called the Missionaries of Charity. The primary objective of this mission was to look after the people who nobody else was prepared to look after. Mother Teresa felt that serving others was a foundational principle of the teachings of Jesus Christ. She often mentioned the sayings of Jesus, and one of them you'll see on the screen here in front of you, whatever you do to the least of my brethren, do it to me. 
Mother Teresa understood that the way that we treat others is the way that we're treating God. If, if you feel no other conviction this morning, or if I feel no other conviction this morning, that's kind of convicting. That however I treat the least of these, I'm treating God that way. Mm. She experienced two particular traumatic periods in Calcutta. The first was the Bengal famine of 1943, and the second was the Hindu-Muslim violence of 1946. Before the partition of India, those things took place. In 1948, she left the convent to live full-time among the poorest in Calcutta. In 1952, she opened her first home for the dying, which allowed people to die with dignity. Mother Teresa often spent time with those who were dying. It afforded many neglected people the opportunity to die knowing that somebody cared. Her work spread around the world. By 2013, there were 700 mission in, missions in over 130 countries. The scope of their work also expanded to include orphanages and hospices to those with term, terminal illness. In 1979, she, received the, she was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize for work undertaken in the struggle to overcome poverty and distress, which also constitutes a threat to peace. What's interesting is she never attended the ceremonial banquet, but asked that the $192,000 fund be given to the poor. Because when you receive a Nobel Peace Prize, you receive a gift with that, and that was $192,000. And she said, no, I don't want that. In later years, she was more active in the Western developed countries. She commented that though the West was materially prosperous, there was often a spiritual poverty. She said this, the hunger for love is much more difficult to remove than the hunger for bread. Which drives us to where we're at in our series today, that all of us have an innate need to be loved. Every person that's ever been created. Why? Because God is love. Which flipped around, we then have a responsibility to show that love. When she was asked how to promote world peace, she replied, Go home and love your family. Over the, the last two decades of her, her life, Mother Teresa suffered various health problems. But nothing could dissuade her from fulfilling her mission of serving the poor and the needy. Until the very last illness, she was active in traveling around the world to the different branches of the missionaries of the charity. Some 4,000 now, I was doing a little bit of reading this week, 5,000 people serve and the mission that she funded. I want us to see this statement that she wrote as we dive into our text this morning. Now that we understand a little bit, and some of you may have known about Mother Teresa. Actually, there's a movie coming out about her life here in the next few months uh, that I think is going to be amazing. But she said this, A Christian is the dwelling place of the living God. He created me, he chose me, he came to dwell in me, because he wanted me. Isn't that an amazing thought? God wants me. God wants you. Now that you have known how much God is in love with you, it is but natural that you spend the rest of your life radiating that love. And I think sometimes the reason why we struggle with showing love is because we haven't truly really felt the gravity of his love to us. That we truly haven't let that thought sink into our minds. That we can do nothing more to make God love us more. And we can do nothing to make God love us less. It's never been based on our actions of how much God loves us. But because he loves us so much, he calls us to live a different way. Why does he do that? Because he wants us to experience everything that he has for us. And so we're going to look over these next 13 weeks, as I shared last week, 
And what is it to show love? How do we do that? What is the tangible expression of showing God how much I love him? And the first one we're going to look at this morning, it might be the hardest one of all, is patience. 1 Corinthians chapter 13 says, love is patient. Patient is something I, I think we can all say this, we all need more of. I've never heard anybody say yet, I'm way too patient. I, I need to work on that. I need to be less patient in this situation. We're always in a hurry. Have you ever had one of those mornings that the alarm didn't go off at the right time? Or maybe it did go off, but you hit snooze too long. Maybe you did that after the first, second, and third, and fourth alarm. You get dressed, and as you're eating breakfast, always seems like when, when you're in a hurry, you spill something on your clothes. More time lost. You get in the car, it won't start. I won't comment on what kind of car it must be. You have a dead battery, more lost time. You feel your blood pressure rise and just thinking about it right now, don't you? Finally, you get the car started. Then you think, it's a straight shot to work. I can still make it on time. And you get behind that person driving 88 kilometers an hour on a 90 stretch. Pressure rises a bit more, doesn't it? Then you hit every stoplight that there is to hit wherever you're going. And I know while all that is going on around us, we are the picture of serenity behind the steering wheel, right? In a news report on July 13th, 2000, in the, it was in USA Today, it was a report on a mo motorist running red light. By the way, I've had a ticket before for running a red light, this is why. The report to be released today uh, as he, the article stated by the Insurance Institute for Highway Safety, found that running red lights injures a quarter of a million people every single year and kills 800 people. This was in the U.S. Another article from the Institute states that every single year, these accidents running red lights kill some 800 people and rack up an estimated $7 billion in property damage, medical bills, loss, productivity, and insurance hikes. And so we are a society that is in a hurry for everything. We have instant everything. We have drive throughs We can call and order our food ahead of time and then just pick it up. And we're not willing to wait for the slightest amount of time. We're always in a hurry. We're always in a rush. That's why I got a red light ticket. Red light cameras are not my friend. I thought I had time to beat it. I was a third of a second too slow. I kid you not, had a picture of my smiling face going through the intersection and the time there. My impatience cost, cost me $300 that afternoon. I knew it was turning red. I didn't even really have anywhere to be. Have you ever lost your patience? We laugh about those types of things, but at times that it really mattered. You see, when we develop the patience in our lives, we can actually get to the point of living a more peaceful life that God has called us to live. And today we're going to look at that one thing called patience that will help us hopefully to stop doing things such as running red lights. But maybe to slow down a little bit and to experience what God has for us. Galatians chapter 5, verse 22 and 23 says this, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. The law is not against such things. We're called to be patient people. It's supposed to be the mark of who we are as a follower of Jesus. Well, we need to remember once again, that when we give our lives to Jesus Christ, we not only receive the gift of eternal life for the future in heaven, but we also receive some wonderful gifts that he wants to give to us. And one of them is patience. And so number one this morning that I want us to see of what patience is, so we understand it a little bit better, is patience is our endurance when faced with the adversities of life. Now, we joked a little bit this morning about some of the adversities, but let's, let's turn the pressure up a little bit. What about those adversities that really do matter? 
What about those times when health is on the line? When we're dealing with those things that are, are, are driving us absolutely crazy. The pressure's on. You fill in the blank. Workplace pressure, home pressures, relationship issues, all of those things. Enduring maybe some injuries inflicted by others. Patience is holding up under difficult circumstances. It involves holding back from the retaliation against someone who maybe has harmed us. And the version of the word that is used here in Galatians chapter 5.22 gives us a picture of long-suffering. Long-suffering gives us a picture of a person who in relation to those, those people that annoy and oppose and all of those types of things, that we refuse to give in to those things. Love is patient. So as followers of Jesus, we must be patient. And so I want to read this morning from 1 Corinthians chapter 13. I said I was going to read it every single week that we're here. I'm reading from the message this morning. The message is a paraphrase that takes some liberties. And so it's not a a direct translation. It's a paraphrase, but it gets the idea just so we hear it in a little different light. And so here's what 1 Corinthians chapter 13 says. If I speak with human elegance and angelic ecstasy, but don't love, I'm nothing but the crackling of a rusty gate. If I speak God's word with power, revealing all the mysteries and making everything as plain as day, and if I have faith that says to a mountain, jump, and it jumps, but I don't love, I'm nothing. If I give everything I own to the poor, and even go to the stake to be burned as a martyr, but I don't love, I've gotten nowhere. So, no matter what I say, what I believe, and what I do, I am bankrupt without love. Love never gives up. Love cares more for others than self. Love doesn't want what it doesn't have. Love doesn't strut doesn't have a swelled head, doesn't force itself on others, isn't always me first, doesn't fly off the handle, doesn't keep score of the sins of others. Oh, that one hurts, doesn't it, just a little bit? We love keeping score, don't we? Don't re- doesn't reveal when others grovel, takes pleasure in the flowing of truth, puts up with anything, trusts God always, always looks for the best, never looks back, but keeps going to the end. Love never dies. Inspired speech will be over someday. Praying in tongues will end. Understanding will reach its limit. We know only a portion of the truth. And what he and what we say about God is always incomplete. But when the complete arrives, our incompleteness will be canceled. When I was an infant at my mother's breast, I gurgled and cooed like an infant. When I grew up, I left those infant ways for good. We don't see things clearly. We're squinting in a fog, peering through a midst, but it won't be long before the weather clears and the sun shines bright. We'll see it all then. See it all as clearly as God sees us, knowing him directly just as he knows us. But for now, until that completeness, we have three things to lead us towards that consummation. Trust steadily in God, hope unswaveringly, and love extravagantly. And the best of these three is love. So the writer here in the message, instead of saying love is patient, says love never gives up. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 2 says, With all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing one another with love. And so number two this morning, patience is inspired by the trust in the fulfillment of God's promise. You see, when we struggle with patience on some of these big life issues, the reason why this is an issue is because we're actually struggling that God is who he said he is. Because if we really believe in God's promises and that he's going to be with us and that he's going to carry us through whatever mess that we happen to be in, we ought not to be impatient. And so our patience is inspired when we trust God completely. When we have complete trust in him hebrews chapter 6 verse 11 to 12 says now we desire each of you to demonstrate the same diligence for the full assurance of your hope until the end so that you won't become lazy 
but will be imitators of those who inherit the promises through faith and perseverance. And so why do all of these things happen the way that they happen? God doesn't want us to become lazy. He wants to grow us and develop us to be the people that he's called us to be. And patience is something that God exhibits towards his creation. Have we ever thought about that before? How incredibly patient that God is to us. God's patience or long-suffering holds open the door to new life to him. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9. Yes, there's a lot of scripture this morning. I really want us to see this. The Lord does not delay his promise, as some understand delay, but is patient with you, not wanting any to perish, but all to come to repentance. And so how do we do when we face problems? can be so difficult to be patient can't it when trials come our way one of the most difficult times to exercise patience for me anyways is when something gets in the way of me getting somewhere but i think that's true of all of us When a problem comes that really slows what we see as progress, we go, God, why? We want instant solutions to our problems in an effort to to fix it as quickly as what it can be. And sometimes that causes us to make bad choices. When we get impatient, we make mistakes, and some of them can be very costly, like running a red light. But in other far greater ways. And so number three this morning, the problems we face are an opportunity to actually see our faith grow. I know we don't like to talk about problems. This isn't a, uh, this isn't a, 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 I was was going to say popular, but it's not an an easy, uh, come to Jesus and he'll, all of your problems will be gone. No, we'll still have problems that we have to deal with in his life. The difference is, is that God will be with us. We don't have to do it on our own. Proverbs chapter 14, verse 29 says, A patient person shows great understanding, but a quick-tempered one promotes foolishness. It's so easy to fly off the handle sometimes, isn't it? A great question to ask is, God, what are you trying to teach me right now? I know it's really easy to look at situations, and I can think of some in my own life, and think, can I I just fast forward this right now? Even sometimes we get a glimpse of maybe what God wants to do. You go, okay, can we just fast forward through the mess? Just want to get through it. But what does God want to teach me in the midst? Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1 and 2 says, Therefore I, the prisoner... In the Lord, urge you to walk worthy of the calling you have received. That's us. With all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love. So number four this morning, we are to be patient with each other. It's not our jobs to return evil for evil. That's God's job. First Peter chapter 3, verse 8 and 9 says, Finally, all of you be like-minded and sympathetic. Love one another and be compassionate and humble, not paying back evil for evil or insult for insult. On the contrary, give a blessing since you were called for this so that you may inherit a blessing. Now what I'm not saying this morning is that we write somebody a check of blind trust and say, you can do whatever you want to me. Please hear my heart today. There are times and circumstances, and that's not being impatient with somebody, but it's using the wisdom that God has given to us when we're walking through some circumstances. But we ought to be reminded that God is so patient with us. So patient with us. Many times we struggle with sin and we get discouraged with ourselves. 
even feel like giving up sometimes, I think, God, where are you? And so I want you to hear this this morning. And it's number five, that God is patient with me. I, I was going to use the, I had just changed this yesterday or Friday. I was going to say God is patient with us or God is patient with you. I forget how I worded it. But I want us to think that this morning. God is patient with me. We cannot and will not be perfect overnight. There are no shortcuts to holiness. I think I shared this last week, or I've shared it in the last couple of weeks. Did you know it took Thomas Edison over 3,000 times before finding an effective filament for the light bulb? Aren't you glad he didn't quit it 2,200 times or 2,500 times or 2,800 times? You see, patience is the ability to keep going and not give up and not give in to the pressures and to the things that the enemy is throwing at us. Listen to these words from James. In James 1, verse 2 to 4, Consider it a great joy, my brothers and sisters, Whenever you experience various trials, because you know that the testing of your faith produces endurance. And let endurance have its full effect so that you may be mature and complete, lacking nothing. Oh, it hurts to grow, doesn't it? God's so patient with us. So number six this morning, we need to be patient with God. God asks for many things of us and promises us rewards for being faithful. We can't under, uh, ever understand all of the reasons why God does what he does and allows what he does does he simply asks us to do them to be obedient and to persevere and so this isn't a message of your hurt and your pain and your struggle doesn't matter it matters a great deal but i want you to hear this morning that god has been so incredibly patient with us will you be patient with him and you say how can i do that it's so hard Maybe you're not in a season right now of really needing some extra patience for those really serious things. I want to give you a couple of things before I wrap up this morning. If we want to cultivate patience in our lives so that we are led by the Holy Spirit and allow Him to be the person He's called us to be. One this morning, lots of prayer. We will need to pray more than what we ever prayed before we have so many opportunities to fail in this area and we must pray for strength to exercise patience and one of the ways in which we can do that is through prayer and it sounds so simple and it says well there's got to be a there's got to be a more complicated answer to all of this but i discovered this especially when dealing with i know i know none of you have difficult people in your lives and so i i know when i share this that you might not really know what i'm talking about But I've discovered, I've got a few in my life. See me after for a lesson. No, I'm just kidding. It's way easier to be patient with them when I'm diligently praying for them. It just is. I don't know how that works. I don't understand the full theology of that. But try it. Number two, allow the Holy Spirit to exercise more power within you. Allow more of God and less of you. You see, the more we allow God to have control, the more we will enjoy the blessings that God wants us to enjoy. And I know one of the things that is true about Western culture is that we are control freaks. We want control of everything. And when we feel like we don't have control, we freak out. When we get impatient, patience is allowing God to do 
what he says he's going to do. This quote isn't up in front of you, but I want to read it this morning before we close in prayer and then break off into our groups. Eugene Peterson in his book, A Long Obedience in the Same Direction. Some of you like writing those things down, A Long Obedience in the Same Direction. He writes this, One aspect of this word that I have been able to identify as harmful to Christians is the assumption that anything worthwhile can be acquired at once. We assume that if anything can be done at all, it can be done quickly and efficiently. Our attention spans have been conditioned by 30-second commercials and 30-second abridgments. And he goes on to talk about the importance of just pausing and allowing the presence of God to soak into our hearts and lives. To slow down and to be patient. So why is this such an important principle that thousands of years ago Paul laid out here in 1 Corinthians, why is love patient? Because love, patience makes us more like Jesus. Is it an easy fix? No. It's not. But it's one in which the more patient we become, the more like God we become. And who doesn't want to become more like Jesus? And so this morning, my challenge for all of you is just those two things. Lots of prayer. And allow the Holy Spirit to exercise more power within you. When those things come your way. Say, God, I don't understand this. I want to move through this at 180 miles an hour. But if you want me to move through it at 25 miles an hour, I will. Let's pray. Father God, this morning, thank you. Thank you for the way in which your word teaches us how to become more like you and how to be led by your Holy Spirit. And so, Father, I pray that you would speak to hearts and minds today. I thank you for the way that you stir within all of us these moments that we have when we go, oh, I need to rest more. And so whatever the takeaway is for each one today, I pray that we would hear from you. And in those moments that we're so tempted to be impatient and to fly off the handle and to snap back because of what somebody has said or what somebody has done. Father, help us to see those people through your eyes. God, it's not a matter of, that is not, in some way, shape, or form, making it okay for them to do the things that they did. Forgive us of that lie that can creep into our hearts. But Father, what it does do, it allows us to be patient with others in the same way that you were patient with us. And so God, thank you for speaking to our hearts and minds today. Thank you for allowing us the opportunity, Lord, to hear from you. So God, I pray that you would help us to be a little more like you. And this week, you would give us an opportunity to exercise your patience growing within us. And we ask these things in your name. Amen. We don't say this every single week, but I hope you know this every single week, that if you need prayer for anything... Uh, We'd love to be able to do that. We always make it a point to hang around, even when we're breaking off into groups a little bit around the front. Uh, We'd love to be able to pray with you. So let's take, uh, so if you need to do that, um, we'll take whatever time we need to do that. So let's take uh, five minutes. We'll say 25 to, and uh, we'll break off into groups. Women over here, men, we're going to meet in the library. Uh, Facilitator questions are back at the back. And uh, we'll spend some time digging a little deeper into the message this morning. God bless you. Thank you so much for being here. And uh, thanks for being part of what God wants to do in your heart and life.